Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Yeshiva Pirkei Shoshanim in, in League with Nativ. My name is Davon Mays. And I'm Diego Boko. And we are doing the B'nai Noah class <clears throat> for Africa. And uh, today we're going to be dealing with one of the seven laws. Ever Men Hakai basically speaking about eating the limb of a living animal and um, some other dietary laws. So we're going to get right into it. I'm going to share a screen. And uh, this is the Noah High Law from the Yeshiva Pirkei Shoshanim Shokana Rug Project, <clears throat> Lesson 49. Tio, <clears throat> you jump in at any time you want. Give some commentary if you like. And uh, here we go. Oh. <clears throat> Introduction. Animals, be they insects, mammals, birds, or slugs, are man's constant companions on this planet. They were created before man, yet are clearly subservient to him, as the Torah tells us. The fear and dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, every fowl of the air, and upon all that, <clears throat> all that teems on the ground and all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As the green herb, I have given you all. Despite the subservient position of animals, man's relationship to them is not without boundaries. Man cannot do to them whatever he pleases. <clears throat> in, in this and the following lesson, we will explore the Torah's expectation for man's relationship with his fellow creations. The source of Sar Balay Kaim, the, the prohibition of causing pain to living things. The Torah prohib <clears throat> prohibits causing the suffering of any living creature without valid necessity. Valid necessity will be defined later in this lesson. Though the Talmud states that the prohibition is biblical, there are variant traditions that is, <clears throat> as to its exact source. For Noahides, making such a determination is important for knowing whether or not the law applies to them. The Gedolim, great te Torah teachers, have proposed a number of possible sources. Ritva and Rabbeinu Peretz explains the prohibition as a halakha le Moshe Misinai, a precept communicated directly by God to Moses without explicit textual source in the Torah. However, it only tells us that Jews were commanded via halakha le Moshe Misinai and implies nothing about Noahides. Shita, Mukubetsis, and Ravad offer Deuteronomy 25 and 4 as a source for the prohibition against cruelty to animals. You shall not muzzle an ox while he is treading out grain. Muzzling an ox during threshing, thus preventing it from feeding as necessary, is cruel. This verse does not come to teach only this specific prohibition, but a broader prohibition against cruelty to animals. However, this verse only communicated to Jews. This verse was only communicated to Jews and not to Noahides. According to Rashi, the prohibition is from Exodus 23 and 5. If you see your enemy's donkey lying under its burden, would you uh, would you refrain from helping him? You shall surely help along with him. Regardless of one's relationship to the donkey's owner, Rashi holds that one must relieve the donkey of its suffering. However, this verse, as Deuteronomy 25 and 4 above, was never commanded to Noahides. Therefore, it does not tell us anything about Noahide obligations. Part of an ever Menachai. Maimonides and Nachmanides write that an underlying purpose of the prohibition of ever Menachai, flesh taken from a living animal, is to prevent causing cruelty to animals. Such an interpretation means that the prohibition of causing suffering to animals is instinctive <clears throat> and intrinsically part of the Noahide code. Maimonides further cites the incident of Balaam and his donkey as proof of the prohibition, the prohibition's inclusion in the Noahide laws. The she donkey saw the angel of the Lord and it crouched down under Balaam. Balaam's anger flared and he beat the she donkey with the stick. The Lord opened the mouth of the she donkey, and she said to Balaam, 
What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Balaam said to the she-donkey, for you have humiliated me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The she-donkey said to Balaam, am I not your she-donkey on which you have ridden since you first started until now? Have I been accustomed to do this to you? He said, no. The Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with the sword drawn in his hand. He bowed and prostrated himself on his face. The angel of the Lord said to him, why have you beaten your she donkey these three times? The Sefer Hasidim also understands the story of Balaam as referring to the prohibition of Sar Bali Kaim. However, the Sefer Hasidim offers a fascinating insight into the mitzvah. A person is punished for any actions that cause a suffering to his fellow. This is even if one causes needless suffering to an animal. For example, if one places it, <clears throat> places upon it a burden so heavy that it, the animal, cannot walk, and uh, and he then hits it, then the future, in the future, such a person will have to give an accounting for this. For causing suffering to animals is a biblical prohibition, as it is written by Balaam. Why did you strike your donkey? As your pun as the as punishments often correspond to the crime. Because Balaam said, if there were a sword in my hand, I will kill you right now. He was himself killed by the sword. See Joshua 13, 22. The warning is learned from the fact that Noahides were not commanded in, dom in dominion. Adam, who was not allowed to eat meat, was given dominion over the animals. However, Noah who was given permission to eat meat was not given dominion. I think that's pretty distinct uh, proof right there. Anything you want to add? Yes, um, I'm struggling to get the distinct. But anyway, uh, I read something that is very interesting that I was not aware of, actually, and that is they say God never gave Adam permission to kill any animal. However, he was allowed to eat meat of an animal that just died by itself. But in terms of him going ahead and killing, he was not permitted. Only Noah was permitted to kill and eat. So I found that interesting, you know. That's something that I, I believe if you go to the Bible, it might be difficult for you to, to get, but I think with uh, extra biblical sources, uh, that's where they came up with this. Interesting, and it's, it's like you really have to think about that situation. Um, and Noah was not given dominion over the animals, but he was given permission to eat. Adam was given dominion, not permission to eat. Very interesting. Elucidating the Sefer Hasidim. The Sefer Hasidim connects the prohibition against cruelty to, cruelty to animals to the permission given to Noah to eat meat and to the blessings given to Noah and Adam. At first glance, the Sefer Hasidim intent the Sefer Hasidim's intent is a little unclear. Let us start by comparing the blessings given to Adam and to Noah. <clears throat> and God blessed them and said, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creeps upon the earth. Compare the language of this blessing very carefully to that of the blessing given to Noah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that teems upon the ground and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand, they are delivered. The Midrash notes a significant change in language in these two passages. Fear and dread returned after the flood, but not dominion. In the blessing to Adam, God granted man dominion over all other life on earth. God's blessing to Noah virtually is virtually identical, except that God did not grant Noah dominion. Rather, he only instilled the fear of man upon the other creatures of the world. In God's original version of creation, man was given the world for domination as a king rules over his dominion. In this state, 
Adam's task was to preserve the order and well-being of the world created for him. His power over the lesser creatures was intrinsic. Adam was given dominion. It appears that as a king, Adam was not permitted to eat meat. Doing so would be to eat his own subjects. However, this divine vision was corrupted beyond all measure. And God saw <clears throat> the earth and behold, it was corrupted for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. Man debased himself and lost his position as a ruler. In the blessing to Noah, we see that man's inherent dominion was replaced with fear and dread. As we see from the above side in Midrash and its commentaries, that before the flood, man was feared because of his inherent dominion. After the flood, God placed the fear of man upon the animals because man lost his dominion. At this point, man was, for lack of a better way of putting it, only the top of the food chain and not a ruler. Therefore, man could eat animals. However, unlike a ruler, man was not allowed to do with the animals as he saw fit. Eating meat and the prohibition of causing suffering are both, therefore, signs of man's debasement and lower position following the flood. Anything you want to add? Yeah, so maybe <clears throat> just to clarify something that we started with, and that is. Uh, um, Usually, when you read from the Jewish uh, uh, sources, they will always say, "Do not eat the limb of a living animal." Um, even though in Hebrew it says "put in that way," it doesn't mean only limbs, but any part of the body of the animal. It's it's not allowed to be eaten while the the animal is still alive. So, yeah. just to bring that that clarity, and I think that also. <clears throat> Uh, on our um, study guides here, if you look down, the verses that we are reading are actually uh, recorded down there. Uh, we might just read a verse without actually telling you that uh, the verse is what. But if you go, if you look at the verse that we read, it will show you in small uh, letters, uh, in small writings there, whether it's 13, 14. If it says 13, it means it's Genesis 6 12 because if you look down there uh, 13 is genesis 12 um, 6 12. Uh, so maybe dave let me just read also again uh, <clears throat> genesis 9 4 where our study is actually based so that we don't lose our our listeners uh, so 9 verse 4 says you must not however eat flesh with its uh, life blood in it uh, so, which means our study today is basically based on that uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. And we are just expounding more on that verse. Absolutely. And uh, in South Africa, in Africa, actually, we have a serious problem of people are killing animals just for, to get certain parts of that animal, right? And it has been a serious, serious problem. And we see that if people learn more about Noahide laws, they will see that these are serious uh, uh, problems uh, that they're causing. It's a serious um, breaking of the law, not of the country, but of the law of God. And so I think this is very important for people, especially because we have got many animals here. And so people are not treating those animals uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way. And that's like referring to like poachers, right? Yes. A lot of poaching. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's that's been a problem for you for years and all over the place, not only in Africa, but in many places in the world where there's wild animals, sure. people poach and there's laws oh. and refugee uh, zoos and camps and stuff like that. And um, not necessarily camps, but a uh, land designated just for those animals to be left alone. Yes. Um, yes. And, Noah um, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I will. Are Noahides permitted from causing <clears throat> other creatures pain? If the source of Sar Bali Kaim is Halakha Le Moshe Misinai, a command given directly to Moses, or from Deuteronomy 25 4 or Exodus 23 5, then it is clear that the prohibition does not apply to Noahides. This is because the verse cited, as well as Halakha's Le Moshe Misinai, were not commanded to Noahides. The Aishel, Abraham, Buksaks, and the pre-Megidim 
uh, hold B'nai Noach are not obligated in Tsar Bailey Klein based on these sources. According to Maimonides in the Sefer Hasidim, however, Noahides are biblically enjoined against causing unnecessary suffering to other living beings. Upon closer examination, it appears these sources are not mutually exclusive. Although the Aisho, Abraham, and pre Magadam hold that Noahides are not obligated to Sar Bali Kaim, that this appears only to be in regard to the Torah verses related to the commandment. After all, these verses explicitly reference the Jewish Sinaitic obligation. Yeah, just to, to say something also there. Sure. <coughs> Sorry. And if, if we look here, if God is so particular about animals that we should not cause pain to animals, what more about a man? You know, in, 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 indirectly, what we are discussing today still touches to some extent to men, mankind. If we are prohibited from causing pain to animals, what more to human beings? And when it comes to human beings, it's actually even more because it's not about physical pain that you can you are prohibited from causing, but also lashon hara, where you cause pain through your speech. That's a great point because verbal abuse is is can be just as painful as physical abuse. Verbal abuse can lead people to commit suicide. And like you said, it just causes a, a steamrolls a bunch of other problems. Um, Proverbs chapter six, when God says he hates gossip, you know, that that is cruelty. You know what I mean? That's causing people pain and suffering um, through your mouth, literally. So, yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, Dennis, you want to say anything? No? Okay. Nevertheless, the Aisha Abraham and Prima Gautam would certainly agree that independent of the Torah verses, Noahide have an ob Noahides have an obligation not to cause harm to other creatures. Admittedly, there are a number of subtle issues inherent in Maimonides and the Sefer Hasidim's derivations. We will discuss these issues in the live class. Regardless of these in issues, there are many other reasons to assume Noahides are prohibited from causing suffering to animals, namely on account of it being of the mitzvot's how muskalos, the logically compelled mitzvot in practice. Because the prohibition may be biblical in nature as opposed to being logically compelled, it is advisable that Noahides practice the obligations according to their full exposition in Torah law. The following is a compilation of the laws of Zar Bali Kaim. To which animals does it apply? The prohibition applies to all animals and apparently insects as well. When does the prohibition not apply? Causing pain to animals is only restricted to unnecessary pain. Man was given the right to use, use animals for his needs, food, clothing, etc. Discomfort that is necessary as part of such use is not prohibited. The need must be genuine and tangible. For example, to force feed an animal so that, it, <clears throat> so that its meat should look more appealing is not acceptable. And we know people do this with certain types of uh, ducks and geese and, and things like that. They stuff the birds and it does something with the liver. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but people will definitely overfeed certain animals to fatten them up, for lack of a better term. And this is just, it's just cruel. Um, even when one is permitted to harm an animal for a valid need, he may not cause more suffering than is necessary. Medical experimentation on animals for the benefit of human health is per permitted. In such cases, though it is praiseworthy to do so, there may not be an actual requirement to endeavor to lessen the suffering of the animals involved. Cosmetic testing on animals are permitted according to most post -king. Others have expressed reservations. However, this issue will be discussed more in the live class. Castration or sterilization of an animal for the benefit of its owner is considered a valid need and is permitted. Similarly, simil <laughs> I don't know why I'm struggling with this word. Similar similarly, the de declawing a cat is permitted under certain conditions. This will be discussed in the live class. Human financial need is also a valid waiver for the prohibition of Zar Bali Kaim, your animal versus that of another. One may feed other 
another animal to his to his dog or other pet. Since he owns the pet, he is responsible for its welfare. Welfare, however, one should kill the food. One should kill the food animal first, as to minimize its suffering. You just don't, you know. I, I, well, it's kind of weird because if you have a snake, I'm not sure you can throw a dead rat to a snake. I think the the the, the rat or the mouse must be alive. So. That one might be a little tricky. I know many people who've had snakes growing up, and I've never seen them give them dead rats or, or mice. It's always something that's alive, so the snake can actually hunt it. So that might be something different. Go ahead, Dennis. You're muted. Um, Y'all may have covered this before. I'm not sure. But when you were discussing the whole thing about the soul, um, that just brought to my mind, you know, in Genesis, when God, Hashem, breathed the soul into man and all mankind. I mean, is not the issue of the concern that Hashem has for animals, the fact that he breathed a soul into them also or does that make sense yeah i mean he, he created them and he doesn't want them to just be needlessly you know no what i mean is that yeah that that they're they're part of his creation and he has a concern i don't understand exactly how but he has a concern for their well-being and man's well-being but man is obviously the center of it and he's given man dominion over all the animals, uh, I guess. And, 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 you know, I was reading the other day that even plants have a soul. They, they actually uh, give off a response to. to I'm just, uh, I'm just saying that there's more to the, there's more to creation. I think than we even have a, even a beginning understanding of. Well, they're alive. I mean, you've, anything that grows is alive. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know. It's alive. I know. So, how do we want to look at that? Yeah, I just had never thought about the whole idea of of a soul. They don't have a spirit, but they do have a soul. And, yeah. If uh, we look at the, if we look at our our lesson for yesterday, you will see that um, not yesterday, last week there are three components that we spoke about there. And so it, my understanding is the animals will have the, the lowest level of, of the soul that is, uh, I think it's nefesh. Right. Uh, yeah, so even like uh, the, the, the plants that will have the lowest, uh, the nefesh. Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's, it's a good point because we we as people we we tend a lot of people not but not everybody but people tend to look down on animals just because of we have that you know sort of uh you know domination over them but they have families too you know yeah they have families they raise their 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 kids i mean it's it, they have the same type of structures we do not all animals of course you know insects and the other other things have they 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 go about it a different way but you know you, have you ever seen a cow or, or, or deer trying to defend its baby from the, the, the leopard? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, they have feelings, you know what I mean? You can, you can tell. And then after they kill the baby or whatever, the, uh, another animal kills a baby, they'll come over and sniff it and like lick on it. Like there's some, there's a connection there. So even though we don't understand how they view such things, they're not just mindless creatures, you know what I'm saying? They have something going on to where they instinctively want to protect their, their babies. A mother bear will fight you tooth and claw, you know what I'm saying, to protect their baby. So they're not, even though they're animals in our eyes, they're not just animals, you know what I'm saying? That is another life, that is another creation. That well, they have made, a, yeah. and we got to respect that. They have know? a purpose. Another, they have a yeah, purpose another, in their life. Yes, another actually sub command of this command that we are busy discussing. I think I've I've read somewhere in, in the in the books where they say you're not allowed to eat a 
a, a bed and and uh, and it's uh, what do you call the eggs you know if you want to even to take the eggs of an of a bird you need to chase it away first not while it's still there you know, just take the the eggs you know it's 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 cruel you're not allowed to do something like that you need to chase it away then you can take the the the, the eggs a chicken you cannot just come and just take the the, the eggs of it uh, the, the eggs while it's still there and chase it away and then you can take the the eggs right and so she doesn't like that, see it exactly so another thing that i remember one rabbi was saying is um if if, if you own a dog and you come back from work, right? And you're hungry and your dog is hungry as well. You need to prepare food for your dog before yourself or even sometimes before your children because you see a human being, um, be because of a neshama, we are given more than just uh, uh, what these animals have been given. We have understanding that I don't have, the food is not in front of me now, but the food is coming. But an animal, a dog will not be able to make that, this, uh, you know, be able to say, there's no food now, but my, the owner is, is making food. So because you are able to understand, you need to give food to your dog first. Because it doesn't understand that if you wait for two minutes, the food is, will be there. You understand. And therefore, start with an animal, and then you can prepare food for yourself after that. Yeah. And they don't have a way to just go in the refrigerator and get food whenever they want. They're all they're completely dependent upon you. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, in the morning, even though their food will be coming out, I have an automatic dispenser for my cats. Before that dispenser dispenses the food, they'll come and one of them will literally come and put his paw on me. He'll just come and put his paw on my leg like, hey, <laughs> what's going on? Oh, uh, you know, what I mean? so I'll, I'll actually feed them if I'm up before the dispenser dispenses it is because if I don't, they'll they'll follow me around and like, hey, if you up, I've been up. So where's my food? So, yeah, completely understand that. And um, there's a verse in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10 says a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So this even a verse in Proverbs that you don't just treat animals any old kind of way, you know, and many people I live in Colorado. It's a real serious, serious animal state. And like we have these certain birds, the, the, the geese, they'll come to the parks and stuff. And if people like hit those birds or something like it's a big problem, you know what I mean? They're, they're crossing the street and backing up traffic and everything, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, they're, 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 the animals out here have a lot of protections. So, you know, completely understand that. Um, your animal versus that of another. Um, or where was I at? Where was I at? I think I stopped at, uh, I, I was at, at, at uh, 10. So you I was at 10, go, okay. Uh, One may, your animal versus that of another. One may feed another. Oh, I did that. I did that to minute to yeah. you, you got to kill the animal. So talking about snakes. Okay. One may not kill an animal to feed it to another's dog or an ownerless animal. One has an obligation to feed and care for his own animal. Denying the animal food or care is considered cruel. However, no hides have no obligation to provide food for other animals. It is certainly praiseworthy to alleviate the hungry of a starving animal, though feeding the squirrels, you know, feeding the birds, having a bird feeder in your backyard, you know what I mean? Um, you got some bread, some extra bread, give it to the squirrels, you know what I mean? I got squirrels that sit on my fence and look in my window like, yo, yesterday <laughs> you gave me some food. Is she going to give me something today? So I completely understand that. Relieving the suffering of an animal and mercy killing. One is only permitted, prohibited from causing unnecessary suffering to an animal. One has no obligation to alleviate an animal's existing suffering. Would you say something? Yeah, yeah. can I just add something before sure. you come? Yeah, so when it comes to also feeding animals and look, uh, taking care of animals, right? Human life still comes first. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you always have to think about the poor, those who cannot afford, who go to, to bed hungry, those should be in our minds, in our hearts uh, as number one, then taking care of animals will come second, but looking after the human life comes first. 
Yeah, and, and this is why stock is important. Uh, for those that don't know, stock is basically charity. And um, if you're going to be giving charity to animals, you definitely should be looking out for people first. You know what I mean? Um, as far as being at the top of the food chain, you know, you, I'm sure you got not everybody uh, has the same situations, but brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, whoever, any pe people on the street, you see them, you know, hungry, you can definitely take care of that person instead of only focusing on, you know, uh, stray animals for, you know what I mean? Cause, um, they would both need things, but of course the person would come first. Um, one has an obligation to feed and care for his own animal. Denying the animal food or care is considered cruel. However, no eyes have no obligation to provide food for other animals. It is certainly praiseworthy to alleviate the hungry of a starving animal though. Relieving the suffering of an animal and mercy killing. One is prohibited from causing unnecessary suffering to an animal. One has no obligation to alleviate an animal's existence suffering. Euthanasia of suffering animals is a much discussed topic in Torah literature. It hinges on this question. It is the act, <clears throat> is the act itself of killing an animal considered sar beli kaim? Some hold that the act of killing is always sar beli kaim, while others hold that it is not. Furthermore, the act of ending the, the animal's life must be viewed in terms of benefit to the owner versus benefit to the animal. This issue must be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And this will take us back to Deuteronomy 17. If you have a discussion that is very difficult, you go to the judges in those days. You go to the rabbis, you go to the authorities to find out the halakha. Dangerous animals and pets. Animals Let that me, pester. Sorry, sorry again, Davia. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go again on what we just already discussed on top of them. And in, in South Africa, I'm not sure in, in America, but we have sometimes problems where it's winter, right? And uh, <clears throat> you have got someone who is the employer who is uh, driving somewhere with his employees and he has got a dog or uh, whatever. He will rather put a dog in front and then he's, he's using a bike, right? And he puts people at the back and he puts an animal in front and people are freezing at the back while he's protecting an animal. So I think it's something that also we need to think about, you know, always think about people. If there is a need, leave the dog, take people wherever they need to be and come back. Then uh, to put people at the back of your bike and it's like minus nine, it's cold, all right? Minus nine degrees Celsius and people are freezing. We see these things, you are driving to work and people are freezing at the back of, of a car. And there is an, un why? That person cannot be in front because there's an animal sitting there. Wow. It's interesting. Yes, some some people don't really think things out. You know, um, I, I, I'm sure everybody knows somebody who has a, has a pet that is treated like better than a human. You know, you see famous stars buy their, their dogs their own house. <laughs> You know, things of this nature. It's like, what? So, yeah, some, some people would definitely put the animal's life over people, unfortunately. Dangerous animals and pests. Animals that pester, sting, or annoy humans may be killed even if they will suffer in the process. This includes insects, dangerous dogs, or other pets and vermin. For instance, people get their house sprayed for spiders and insects and ants and stuff like that um because they can destroy you know uh, termites can destroy your house um you know spiders can bite and you know cause a lot of problems um i know a person who uh, got bitten by a spider his whole arm swole up you know what i mean and then and there goes your partner saw if you're working you know what i mean so certain things have to be taken care of and um unfortunately um now just to be going around killing animals for the sake of doing it you know that that's not permitted at all so we know people who torture animals needlessly often have signs of growing up to be like like serial killers and stuff like that. They always look in their background and they'll say this person was known for, you know, just killing cats and dogs and torturing animals as a kid. So when you see people doing that, it just kind of gives you a insight on the, into their psyche, their mind state, their mind state. Nevertheless, 
it is better that they be killed in a passive manner, traps, et cetera, so that a person does not become accustomed to killing and taking life. So, yeah, you know, there's there's a way to do it. You don't just randomly kill the animals. You can you set up traps and things like this. You don't just, you know, go around shooting at, you know, mice and things like that. You can definitely set traps for them. Um, labor animals. Labor animals may be struck or prodded as minimally necessary to direct their labor. This is considered necessary for human benefit. Hunting. Hunting, unless an actual necessity for food or hide, is considered a cruel endeavor and should not be done. The only people described as hunters in the Torah are cruel people such as Nimrod and Asaph. Capturing animals for human profit is certainly permitted. Zoos, therefore, pose no issue as long as the animals are properly cared for. So that's pretty much the, the lesson on that. Um, anybody want to elaborate on anything else? Maybe let me add one more thing on my side, and that is there is another prohibition that we didn't touch today, but is the prohibition of mating two different species of animals, uh, two different animals, you know, uh, that is not allowed as well. And I, when my high school years, I was doing agriculture, we used to actually do that, you know, we, we were taught how to do all these things castration and all those things and so today we have learned that those things are not allowed good point and actually the, the there's another lesson lesson 50 actually covers the mixing of species which is what you're talking about um and there's a lot of dogs that are bred like that that a lot of species were created by people taking certain breeds and creating certain other breeds for specific needs you know what i mean so um it I'm sure there's other species that are, you know, that is known that is, that that's known to take place. But for some reason, people have done that with dogs extensively. You know, there's a lot of that going on with, with dogs for certain reason, for hunting purposes, for hunting specific animals. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, um, the mixing of like when the, when the Torah says, you know, you can't mix seeds. You know what I mean? So some people have done that to create different species of plants and things of that nature too. Dennis, did you raise your hand? No? Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> one second. Well, with that being said, um, that's today's class covering um, cruelty to animals, ever Menachai. And um, we will see you guys next week. And um, let's T.O., if you got anything else to say, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. All right. Shalom.